Thank you, everyone. Good morning. And uh, it is great to be at uh, Christian Family Centre Seton uh, to be with you and, and speak with you this morning. Uh, Pastor Phil reminded me in the previous service that it was 25 years ago this year that Judy and I walked through the doors of the Christian Family Centre at Seton. Uh, Josh was four and Emily was two uh, and I was 30. Um, anyway, uh, and uh, it was literally a quarter of a century ago, Phil, and you were a different age as well, Phil. Um, but we won't ask Judy how old she was, but it was, it was a, a wonderful day, a life-changing day for us and just a joy to be invited back here to uh, speak to you again this morning. Um, when it comes to work, some of us have a love-hate relationship with our work. And everyone said? Yeah, okay. Uh, in fact, some of us have a hate-hate relationship with our work. Uh, now, that may not be true for all of us. Uh, some of us may love what we do for a paid job and, and love going to work. Uh, but uh, for some of us, even at some parts of our life, uh, if not for, for a lot of our life, uh, work can be a mixed blessing. I remember uh, during my 20 years working in the media as a, a journalist and a broadcaster uh, that I got to the stage where I noticed a, a sequence in my life uh, where you could say I was in a rut um, and uh, I, I named the days of the week to reflect my journey through the working week and my frustration. You, would you like to hear them? Okay, mournful Monday. That was the first one, mournful Monday. Terrible Tuesday, woeful Wednesday, right? What a disaster. Thoughtful Thursday, you're starting to think the weekend's coming. Thoughtful Thursday, fantastic Friday, sensational Saturday and sublime Sunday. Mournful Monday, anyway. <laughs> now, when you think about it, to write off more than half of your working week as a disaster isn't really that smart and is a bit sad. Uh, and the good news is that through prayer and reflection and God's grace, uh, I ended up renaming uh, the days of the week and I'll share that with you a bit later on. Uh, but the fact is, I think you'd be encouraged to know, I hope, that there actually are sound scriptural and spiritual reasons for why work sometimes uh, feels like both a, a blessing and a curse. Um, and we're going to unpack those today. Uh, Pastor Sam referred to some of those in his message last week. Um, and the reason we're doing this series, the reason why we would talk about work at church is because some of you, in fact, possibly a lot of you need help with your work. Need help with your work. For some of you, you need a new vision of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and who you do it for. Now, some of you might have just thought, well, I, I don't need a new vision, Pastor. I need a new venue for my work. Uh, now, interestingly, sometimes that actually is part of the solution. That actually sometimes is an answer. Some of you don't have the courage uh, to change jobs, but God actually is willing to lead you to that decision if it's part of his plan for you. So we're going to talk about a little bit about how we reflect on that. Our series is named Kingdom Calling, as Sam said. Uh, his message was Mondays Matter. And he reminded us that God is passionately interested in what happens to the lives of Christians beyond Sunday. So sometimes we're in this, we, because we call it the weekend, we think Sunday is the last day of the week and we crawl into church and, you know, then we're going to lo load up and go again the next day. But Sunday in the traditional uh, calendar that we use is actually the first day of the week. So as we gather here today, yes, we do celebrate the goodness of God, but we actually set a platform for moving out from here as of tomorrow. So God actually doesn't just want us to retreat here on Sundays, but he wants us to uh, take, if you like, what we might get from Sunday and step out into the working week with his favour, with his blessing and with his assurance. Today's message is called blessed or called to be a blessing. 
So the work that God gives you to do actually has a purpose for you, but get this, for everyone else as well. It's not just about paying the bills. It's not just about doing a job. It's actually about being a blessing to yourself and to others as you work. Now that we've accepted that our work matters to God, what do we do about that? How do we respond to the fact that at times uh, our work seems like a curse? It seems frustrating. We even despair at times uh, of the work that we do. As I was preparing for this message this week, I really felt that there is uh, something that some people here need to hear. Uh, and that is, there is a blessed way for you to work. Now that mightn't sound like a very powerful or even a prophetic statement, but I feel that some of you have given up on the idea that your work can be a blessing to you and to other people. You, you, you've lost the vision, you've lost the passion, perhaps you never even discovered it or knew it, you just fell into a job and the idea that uh, you can be a blessing and work can be a blessing to you, you've just lost that. And I feel that today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God would recast for you a new way of working or possibly even a new place to work. That either of those could be the solution to this problem. Now, sometimes uh, you might have heard a person say, uh, you might have said it, I've got the job from hell. I don't know, is that ever past your lips? Well, you know, that's potentially or theoretically true. However, you might be shocked to know that the idea of work actually comes from God. So however you might feel about your paid work, we need to give attention at some stage of the fact that it's actually God that gave us the, the goal and the vision for work. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, not to stare at the stars, but to work it and to take care of it. To work it and to take care of it. So the idea that we work and that we take care of something, we take responsibility for something, that comes from God. And you know, even that scripture alone, even that scripture alone from some of you is helping you right now. Because you, you couldn't even imagine that your work actually might come from God, that that role and that task actually might come from Him. And I think that's an encouragement to you already. However, while we're talking about work, it's important that we stress that work actually does have its limits. It must be subservient to God, lest it become an idol. And that's a risk that can be found in the church as, as well as in the, the outside church world. Uh, and so therefore work has to be broken up by rest and leisure. It's potential, it's possible in this world where some people's work becomes their whole meaning and whole definition of life. But we read in Genesis chapter two elsewhere, it says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Work is not only from God. When we work, we imitate God who worked by creating the world that we are part of. That, that was the work of God. But even God said, this far and no further. Even God himself said, I will now rest and take a break. And some of you here today, or listening online, are workaholics. And you cannot mentally even take a break. When you are offered holidays or a day off or something like that, you feel guilty, you feel ashamed, you find something else to do somewhere else when you're supposed to be resting and you are addicted to work. And that verse there out of Genesis chapter two is for you because you need to know that it's good for you to take a break, it's good for you to have holidays, uh, you need to ha have some relief from your work. So you might be frustrated by your work, but it could be because you're addicted to it and you need a break. 
Okay, so we've said that work's commissioned by God, that, that all work, uh, whatever it is, has dignity, uh, but that's not to say that we don't have uh, problems at work. And let's talk a bit of, uh, about a few of those. Tim Keller, in his excellent book, Every Good Endeavour, uh, says that sin, both ours and that of others, which originates in our, our fallen nature, uh, means that some work can become fruitless, pointless and selfish. Um, we look at Genesis chapter 3 and we see that sin does distort work, making it at times a burden and full of thorns and thistles. It says in uh, Genesis chapter 3, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Have you ever noticed uh, how in your garden you don't have to fertilise weeds? I, I, I just, I've noticed this. I've never seen anyone fertilising weeds, but they grow just fine. So there's a sense that when we're looking after our garden, whether it's a real garden or whatever it is, that there's stuff in it that's unwelcome, stuff in it that is a result, if you like, uh, of the curse of sin. And Tim Keller actually has um, an interesting suggestion where he suggests the best approach is to accept fruitlessness as part of a fallen world. So that's interesting. Just say, well, look, there's aspects of my job that are not going to be pleasant, that are not going to be fruitful, that are not going to be good, that are going to be frustrating. Because some of us sometimes, as soon as we have a down day at work, we're making plans to exit tomorrow. But we need to get off that roller coaster of up, down, up, down, up, down, and just say, look, as Judy loves to say, no job is perfect. Uh, that even... Uh, when we work at church, we have to deal with frustrations and challenges all the time. So I reckon that's a relief to some of you already, that some of you are just setting the bar too high in your job. If it's not this good, then you're ready to just bail out. But actually, frustration is part of it. Um, Keller says, this is an interesting quote, you should expect to be regularly frustrated in your work even though it might be exactly the right vocation that God has called you to, yet God can and often does change what he calls us to do. So right now, that idea is opening up for you some possibilities. Because you've never thought that changing jobs is something that you would think about or consider uh, but really, I'm probably preaching you today because I changed my job uh, 20 years ago, I think it was. I need to calculate that one later. And I'm going to talk about the difference between staying put and doing the will of God and the difference about moving and doing the will of God because there is a difference. We'll talk about that for you. One of the great uh, encouragements to me, and uh, Pastor Sam mentioned this scripture in the ministry time last week, and I was so excited when I heard it. And I thought, today I'm going to put it on the screen because the following scripture should be an encouragement for everyone who works, but it should be an encouragement for everyone who works with their hands or does something creative uh, because you may sometimes think, I'm not sure where God is in this work. You know, I mean, I, I think God's with Pastor David when he's preaching, but I don't know where he's with me on Wednesday when I'm, you know, in a ditch. Well, check this out from uh, Exodus chapter 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, and this is just before the building of the, 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 the temple, uh, before the building of the tent where they worshipped, see... I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. So God chooses him. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding and with knowledge. Now at that point, you're thinking, this is great. This guy, Bezalel, he's been called to be a priest. Uh, God's, God's filled him with the Spirit, filled him with wisdom, filled him with understanding and with knowledge. I mean, that's clearly what he's going to do. But it then takes a bit of a turn. 
And the Lord says, and with all kinds of skills. Now, I just let's just get that straight. With all kinds of skills come from God, the gift of God to that person. Now, what for? To make artistic designs for work in gold, silver and bronze. To cut and set stones, to work in wood, the world's first carpenter, to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, I practised that earlier, on the tribe of Dan to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything that I've commanded you. So friends, the idea that God equips people to do spiritual jobs and not others to make stuff is biblically wrong. And some of you here today have just been inspired by the fact that God cares and that it equipped you to do work of that nature. In fact, God's interested in the maintenance and the flourishing of all of his creation, including the work done by unbelievers, because it reflects and betters the world that he's made. And I really hope that inspires some of you today and that, and that you put aside the idea that God's interested in the work of the pastors, but he's actually a bit disconnected from what I'm doing. That is not true. And that's part of you rediscovering or discovering for the first time a new calling and a new passion for your work. Now, I could call on many examples to illustrate this today, but uh, when in doubt, talk about your wife. <laughs> Poor old Jude. This is her sitting in the front row and being talked about in public is like dying. I said, honey, would you like to come up on the stage with me while I do this? And she said things. She didn't swear. <laughs> but I think the next thing would have be, been, you do that and it's over. No, no. It's over. So anyway, she's sitting there in the front row. Perhaps, can we get a close up, Nick? No, don't do that. Okay. Now, look, the reason I use Jude when it comes to skills, right? Uh, Judy, as a young girl, Jude basically wanted to be a teacher. Uh, and a preschool teacher from a young age. She went to <laughs> the College of Advanced Education at uh, McGill to do her preschool, uh, now UniSA, and basically has worked in that space for a long time. She, in fact, next January celebrates 20 years as the preschool teacher at M Faith Montessori Centre at Royal Park. <laughs> now, um, for many of you, this is not news because Judy, by God's grace, has uh, had lots of children from this church in her class down there and uh, all of the Vasilakis grandchildren, all of the Kipitoglu grandchildren, the children of pastors. She even has the son of a two times gold medalist from the Commonwealth Games in her class Little Jack McHugh. Notice how I work myself into that story. Um, in fact, I, I'm thinking about, let's just check the category that that puts me in. I am the husband of a woman who teaches the son of a two times <laughs> Commonwealth Games God medalist. Those medals are literally around my neck. <laughs> Good on you, Chris. Glad you were here to hear that. I think if I play played beach volleyball, I'd spend more time in the sand than on it. And the ball would bounce off my head more than my hands. But, um, you know, Jude has had uh, many opportunities. Uh, well, she's been asked, do you want to be the director? Do you want to be the manager? Do you want to do this, that? And Jude has consistently said, no, I'm meant to be with the kids. I'm a teacher. And Judy discovering her passion uh, and her competency at a young age and just working it has released a wave of blessing over the kids of believers and non-believers alike. We go to West Lakes, people come up, we have families with three kids, Judy's had all of them, and I just stand off to the side and smile. They talk to Jude, they don't even know who I am, and they don't care. Um, <laughs> but that happens a lot. And so that's been a great influence. And for any of you who have been a parent or no one, when your child is two or three, 
Mate, you are, you've got worries. You've got concerns. You've got cares. And Judy just releases peace uh, and, and confidence and favour into people's lives by caring for competently their kids. So that's just an example. And Jude has, has released that gift into the church. He was a kids leader here for 18 years before we headed up to the hills. So, uh, you know, that was a great example. So that's just an example of a very simple thing that then releases blessing. What's your competency? What's your calling? What's your passion? How is it or how might it be released into the lives of others? Interesting, interesting question, don't you think? That's great. Okay, so therefore, because it seems all work pretty much uh, is, is of God or can be used for God, we shouldn't be surprised that Colossians chapter three says, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it, firstly, with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It's the audience of one to begin with. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving, not yourself. So it follows, I think, from that scripture that because you're called on to do, uh, because it says whatever you do, it's possible that whatever you do can be done for Christ. Now, I'm sure there are some jobs and some tasks that, you know, it might, we might struggle to redeem in terms of the goodness of humanity. But the opportunity is there for us to work for the good of God. So you've heard this message, you're wondering about your own job. How does this all come together? How do I dedicate it to, to God? You know, how do I get to where I need to be to do this? I'm gonna start with, a. have just got two points. And the first one, it might seem a bit simplistic, but the first one is simply say yes to Jesus. Because I think we've all just seen in our community that work that is disconnected from God, that's disconnected from Jesus, sometimes you just think that's out of control. There's no redemption to that, that process. Um, Jesus actually has a calling for everyone. And he says in John chapter six, Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And folks, I'm saying to you today, you've just got one job to begin with. And that's to just say yes to Jesus. That is to believe that he is the one that the Father God sent into the world. That's where work starts. The Jewish followers at the time were gathering around Jesus and saying, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And he just says, believe in the one that God has sent. So, I wanna suggest if you're struggling in relation to your work, the starting point is to dedicate yourself to Jesus and then dedicate everything you do to Him because one of two things will happen. Firstly, you'll look on your current work completely differently. You'll say, Lord, this is for you. I'm dedicating this to you. All of a sudden, you'll be praying over your work and saying, Lord, help me with this, help me with that. And Phil and I were talking about this earlier. I, I pray over my job every day and I pray very simple, specific prayers. What I do is I often look, where's the anxiety in me? Someone once said, big enough to worry about, big enough to pray about. So if I'm anxious about this meeting, if I've got a thing that I, I'd really like this to go well, I just tell God, I just say, Lord, please be with me in this meeting today. I pray for each of the persons in the meeting and I just say, Lord, this is what I would like to see happen. If it's off track, God will show it to me. If it's according to his will, he'll favour it. And I think some of you are getting driven nuts by work and you haven't talked to God about it. You don't invite him into your working day. You think, I pray on Sundays and then I'm gone for the rest of the week. But God actually wants to step into the work you do. So I just encourage you today, say yes to Jesus, invite him into your work, pray over it. But then possibly as you do that, you might 
the spirit might start to move and you might start to get the feeling, I'm on the move. I'm actually, God's, I think God's moving me because I'm praying over this. I'm dedicating my life to Jesus. I'm wanting to give him everything I do. And he's saying, thank you. And I'm now gonna reposition you. Let you I'll just talk a little bit more about that in a moment because that relates a bit more to my story. Do you know, God the Father worked when he made uh, the creation. Jesus worked. John chapter four, verse 34 says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Uh, Jesus was a carpenter as a young man. And then I guess you could call him a minister and a missionary beyond the age of 30. And the work that he's referring to here is his death on a cross. It, it, it was not only his ministry, but it was then his death on a cross that was part of that process. So we've said yes to Jesus. We've invited him into our work. We've committed our work to him. What if uh, that then starts to involve a change? The, the second thing I've mentioned here is pursue your passion through work. Now, some of you are hearing me say that and you think, I think I've heard that somewhere else, but I just don't know what it means when it comes to work. Most of us understand the necessity of being passionate about Jesus, God, all right? Yeah, yeah, that's God, you know, of course. We were singing earlier, we were going great. Um, most of us get the idea of being passionate about our spouse or our family. Yeah, of course, yeah, I love them. Even our sports team even the Commonwealth Games. We can get the idea about being passionate for that. But when I talk to you about being passionate about work, you're thinking, that's weird. But actually, it's I'm giving you permission to be passionate about your work. And as I said earlier, that's gonna be loosely one of two things. It's either gonna be a new way of looking at your work or it's going to be a change. And this happened to me, uh, I've got to calculate, Phil, 20, just under 20 years ago. Um, I spent the 20 years working in the media and uh, at the time in 2003, I was working for 891 ABC Adelaide and there were directions in front of me. Um, politics, sport broadcasting, uh, you know, right there. But it just was not sitting properly. I was starting to sense that that was not going to be it. And then uh, I can still remember, uh, Judy and I were sitting in church in 2003, Pastor Bill was talking about one of his short-term mission trips to Papua New Guinea. And I just, I'm just thinking, that sounds fantastic. And I'm saying to Judy, oh, that'd be, that'd be good. And I know sometimes Bill takes people with him. And of course, as soon as we get out to the front door, Judy says to Bill, Dave wants to go with you to Papua New Guinea. Uh, it was quite adventurous for Jude. Um, and, um, and that was it. And I went on the short-term mission trip, November 2003, and my world changed in a fortnight because I realised then that my passion was to serve the purposes of God through pastoral ministry and I guess church employment, if you want to call it that. And the rest of it just fell away. I went and saw my boss the next year and, and resigned uh, after 20 years in the media and away I went in 2005, started work here on staff at the Christian Family Centre at Seton. And, um, you know, I just, I just knew that something had changed in me. For some of you, it's not necessarily becoming a pastor, but it is a change of employment. Uh, we've heard the phrase toxic job and you're trying to make it work and you're hitting away, but actually that's not where it's gonna be. It looks different. And it's a, it's a bold thing to think in those terms at times, but I'm actually gonna allow you to think about the possibility that there may be a change coming. Many years later, after I'd made that change, uh, when I got to um, schools ministry group a couple of years ago, uh, Pastor Phil and myself work as um, regional managers there, as, as does uh, Sam's brother-in-law, John Day. And it felt like, I felt it's time to rename the days. 
So you know what I went with? Magnificent Monday, terrific Tuesday, wonderful Wednesday, thrilling Thursday, fantastic Friday, sensational Saturday and sublime Sunday. Who wants a week like that? It's not that we're walking around with a permanent grin plastered on our face, but it's just that we actually speak favour of God over every day that we're given. Now, as the song says, some days are diamonds, some days are coal. But we expect and believe that God is able to work through every day that he gives us, Sunday, Monday or otherwise. And for some of you, I reckon that's gonna create a new vision, a new dream and a new way of thinking about your work. All right, how are we going? All right, we're going okay. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna skip forward again to the Ecclesiastes passage and we're gonna move towards a time of communion. Um, One of the greatest blessings that I have ever seen spoken over work is this taken out of Ecclesiastes chapter three. The writer says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Oh, that sounds good. Happy and to do good. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all of their toil. This is a gift from God. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, This is a gift from God. And I would love everyone listening online today or here at the Christian Family Centre to understand that 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 description of work and satisfaction is a gift from God, but the good news is that he gives good gifts and that while it might seem a 100 miles away from where we are at the moment, It's possible to follow after Jesus. It's possible to walk in his footsteps. It's possible to dedicate our working life to him and to discover a passion and a presence and a favour and a fruitfulness that we never thought was possible from Monday to Saturday. And I really am going to pray in a moment I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray that everyone here has a renaissance and a reawakening when it comes to work. Because we not only need you smiling here at church on Sunday, but we need you thriving in the workplace on Monday to Saturday. Because for a lot of people, they're just not going to come here, but they're going to see you giving thanks to God, working in your passion, blessing those around you. And maybe one day when someone finds out that Judy Bland's a Christian, they might say, that makes sense because she blessed my family. Is this true, folks? I wanna finish before we pray with Deuteronomy chapter two, verse seven. This wonderful pronouncement, speaking over God's people, the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. When I pray for our work, Phil, I just say, Lord, bless the work of my hands. May what we do result in good to others. May your favour be on our efforts to wire something together. It doesn't happen all of the time, but I want God in and through what I'm doing as I wake. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for the encouragement that you've given us from our word about work. And Lord, I guess all of us would stand here today and confess, acknowledge uh, that there are times when we have cursed our work, when we've felt our work was a curse. But Lord, we sense that being engaged in something from day to day has merit. It feeds us as well as causes us to flourish when it works well. And Lord, I really want to pray today for everyone here at the Christian Family Centre, for everyone listening online, that 
their image and their vision of their work would be changed, would be transformed, that they would go from here today looking at their work in a way they never thought possible. Lord, I know for some people here, that's just a change of attitude. It's just a change of vision. They didn't know that they could dedicate their work to you. While for others, a change, a physical change is coming. They need to have the courage and the commitment to say, yep, I'm I'm on the move. It's time to do something different. And that is gonna be the gateway where you're gonna bless their work. So Lord, whatever the situation, I pray that you give people wisdom and insight. And Lord, I also pray that you remind all of us the first job we are given is to say yes to Jesus. That none of us can truly please you in work or at church unless you are number one in our life. And I don't know where you stand today as we pray in relation to Jesus. I don't know whether you'd call yourself a Christian or a follower of Him, uh, whether you'd say you'd been born again. But I do want to make just a moment here where if you have a strong sense that the first job you've got to do is to say yes to Him, is to become a Christian, is to be a follower of Him, that I just want to make a moment for you to do that right now. And perhaps you would pray a prayer, you would speak to God uh, in something like this. You'd say, Lord Jesus, I accept that you died for me. Lord Jesus, I accept that you died so that I can have life. I don't understand everything about being a Christian, but I want that life that you died for me to have. Lord, heal me, help me, save me, I pray in Jesus' name.